The Institute of Risk Management South Africa, IRMSA, uh, provides insightful information for all decision makers uh, in all organizations across the country with the important risk primer. It's the Risk Report 2022. It's out in February. And this report is going to build on IRMSA's role as a catalyst for positive change in organizations across the country. And boy, don't we need that. Um, it's all reflected in the theme this year, hashtag step up now is the time. We've been having a number of conversations around the report and ahead of its release. And I'm joined now by uh, Michael Brown, Chief Executive Officer of Nedbank, as we look further at the risk climate in South Africa. Uh, Mike, a very warm welcome to you. Before we get to the risk stuff, I know that you've just attended the World Economic Forum uh, meeting. Anything leaping out at you this year? Yeah, firstly, that it was another virtual meeting. Mm. It was uh, supposed to be a physical meeting right up until the mid of mid December. So I guess inherent in that is is how quickly things change and and how risks can emerge much mm. faster than, than one thought, particularly around something like like Omicron. But if I think about the, the WEF meeting uh, from a risk point of view, I think the key conversation was around inequality and effectively how the pandemic has accelerated inequality on the health front and on the economic front. And, you know, just a couple of data points around that that, that would be, you know, key for me that remembering on the health front, you know, there was a data point put into the room that said, you know, while many advanced economies in the world, people are talking about their fourth doses, etc. Mm. In Africa, more than 70% of frontline medical workers have still not been vaccinated. So enormous inequalities in the health outcomes. And then again, on the economic outcomes where, you know, globally those countries or businesses or people who have had businesses that continue to operate online, you know, largely digital businesses have been extraordinarily mm. successful. Whereas other businesses that couldn't do that or countries that, you know, were perhaps more reliant on things like tourism, et cetera, have had extraordinary difficult uh, experiences. And if you look at that inequality risk that you talk about, particularly in developing economies and back home in South Africa, there is almost a negative symbiotic relationship between the two. That is something that we're going to have to get to grips with in this country, and it is listed prominently in this year's risk report. Absolutely. I mean, you know, certainly on the health front, you know, what is the world learning? They're learning that that you can't lock yourself out from the rest of the world from this disease. The only way to resolve this sustainably is to do it on a, on a global basis. And, and clearly, again, if you look at the inequality that has been that was in our country already at, you know, unfortunately, let's call it world record proportions, um, you know, all that's going to have happened over the last two years is that's going to have got worse. And if you think about that from a business point of view, you know, we all know it's difficult enough to run a business successfully. It's extraordinarily difficult to run a successful business in an unsuccessful society. And for a society to be successful, it needs to have higher levels of equality to be stable. So how do we get to grips with that problem of inequality as a risk factor in South Africa? So there are multiple you know, uh, ways that, that have been thought about doing that. But certainly what, what I think is the only long-term sustainable way of improving levels of equality comes through a combination of higher economic growth, which drives employment, and better educational outcomes. Growth and education is, to my view, the only sustainable way to close the inequality gap. And what role does your sector need to play in this respect? An extraordinarily important, important role, particularly on the growth front, because if you, if you stand back, you know, growth is driven by investment and capital allocation. So our sector needs to be and has been a very strong voice in the inhibitors to investment in South Africa, and I'm sure you'll ask me about those mm. later, and therefore as a consequence, our 
unacceptably low levels of economic growth and job creation over, over the last 10 years. So we need to ensure that we present a much more investor-friendly environment to generate growth and allocate capital. So let me ask you the question sooner rather than later then. What do you need to do to smooth that uh, investor process? Again, you know, there, there are multiple things, but, but I think what's become increasingly evident from a risk point of view over the last two to three years is that the factionalism within our politics in general and the ruling party in particular is preventing both the, um, both the development of meaningful economic reforms but has also completely hamstrung our ability to implement any of them. Mm. And, and therefore, as a consequence, economic growth and unemployment suffers. So, so we absolutely need to significantly accelerate structural economic form and implementation. And within that, clearly, electricity supply is right at the top of that. We cannot mm. grow faster when we don't have enough electricity. Let's get to electricity in just a moment, but the issue of factionalism is interesting, whether it's in the ruling party, whether it's in opposition ranks, or whether it's in business or civil society itself, it doesn't matter. All of solving that is predicated on good leadership, which the Ermsa Risk Report 2022 lists as the biggest risk factor facing this country right mm. now. So across the board, where do we need to see, I wonder, a recalibration when it comes to leadership? Yeah, I think everybody needs to take a step back and understand what they could do better. And, you know, that's both in business, civil society and, and with, within politics. But, you know, I think if you look at the data and evidence over, over the last three years, I think we have to, at a political level, have significantly stronger leadership uh, than what we have seen to ensure that we really effectively root out the culture of corruption that has been so evident in mm. our um, ruling political party and unfortunately has infected many other parts of society. So organizations like yours and others will take some solace from the fact then that we've had edition one of the Zonda report, which is, is castigatory in, in some ways of, of certain individuals. Um, that's a starting point, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Providing um, it's followed through. Uh, mm. Absolutely, mm. and we need, you know, edition mm. two and then you know, I think the real event will be edition three, mm. which is, in my understanding, the report that will contain the final recommendations, uh, and then we need to implement them, which is something that we have not historically been particularly good at. Let's look at other risks facing South Africa right now, and then I want to focus on risks particularly as far as uh, the banking sector is concerned. You mentioned electricity. Other issues that are high up on the list are climate change, for instance. What's, uh, what's worrying the exco at, at your organization in terms of local risk? What do you need to get to grips with? Yeah, so, so look, I think if we, if we start out with you know, what lives on our risk register in, in the organization, right at the top is, is a risk that we would call business risk, which is effectively what we've just been talking yes. about. It's the politics of South Africa and its implication on economic growth rates going forward and what does that therefore mean for unemployment, social stability, and our ability to fund the social safety net that we currently, currently have in place. So I think that's right up there. And very, very closely linked to that is obviously our fiscal trajectory as a country and ensuring that we are able to maintain a fiscal framework that enables our country to keep its sov sovereignty and not be reliant on external debt providers and eventually have to go you know, with the so-called begging bowl to, to the IMF. So that's certainly you know, right, up, right, up, right up top there. I think linked to all of that is, is the failures that we've seen in public infrastructure and service delivery 
And you know, what does that therefore mean for our clients? What does it mean for our organization? And how can we all play our part in trying to, to turn that around and, and help it? And the optics of the negative consequence were evident in the June riots last year, for instance. Uh, we cannot have a repeat of that. Uh, absolutely. And you know, uh, we, we certainly saw an, an extraordinary negative reaction globally to, to, those, to those June riots. Mm. And, you know, the, the global investor meetings that we've been sitting in, in, you know, let's call it Q3, Q4 for last year, have, you know, some of the, the most negative comments in them around the, the big picture risk environment in South Africa for, for investors. So there's a huge job of work to do mm. to make our country feel safer for investment, to drive growth, to drive, to drive uh, I employment. You know, just thinking about the other risks, I mean, I think what's, what's interesting is the, the transition that we're seeing in, in how we think about, let's call them the risks closer to home rather than these big picture mac macro risks. And, you know, for the last two years in the crisis, you know, very much front of mind for banks generally and for Nedbank would be the impact of the crisis on let's call them the traditional banking banking risks, all the ones that, that people grow up learning about, credit risk, liquidity risk, capital risk, operational risk, business continuity plans, you know, all of those things were right at the top of the, of, of the risk register. But as we have become, and we certainly can't be overconfident, but as we've become slightly more used to living alongside the virus mm -hmm. relative to that deep crisis in, in Q2 2020, you know, we do start to think more about people risk. How have our people come through an extraordinary difficult period? How have they changed their thoughts about what work means? And how do we stay engaged with, with our staff? That is so important. I would say to you that two years ago, uh, issues of mental health within an organization might have been laughed out of court. No longer. You cannot not engage with that right now. You're absolutely right. You, you yeah. absolutely mm. Lutley, have to. And you know, the, the sort of psychology of, of, of humans would have been um, <laughs> that, that as the crisis hit, you know, in many ways it's, it's energizing. How can, we, how can we deal with this sort of external mm. monster that's come in our direction? How do we get, you know, suddenly, you know, you know, 23 of our 26,000 people working remotely. How do you still service, you know, your 8 million clients? It, there's, a, there's some energy in, 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 in doing all of that. But inevitably, you know, that energy wanes mm. and, and, and people start thinking about the losses that they've experienced personally and, and financially. And it becomes more and more difficult to keep teams and cultures together in a largely work from home environment. I would be remiss if I didn't conclude the interview by asking you to reflect on two other issues. Um, many years ago, uh, your organization nailed its colors to the mast when it came to the green debate. Climate risk is a problem now. How does that factor into your or onto your risk register? So, as I said, as I said a little bit earlier, you know, we've definitely as we've come through the crisis, transitioned away from the traditional risks of, you know, credit risk, liquidity mm. risk, capital risk, et cetera. And, and many, many new risks are, are coming up. Probably the top of which would be climate risk and cyber risk. And if I, and if I sort of stay on the, on the climate in, mm. in environment, you know, that is, let's call it the defining challenge of the next 30 or 40 years. Mm. Um, we simply know that the science tells us we cannot continue on the current trajectory. And for our organization, we absolutely want to be at the forefront of enabling the economies in the countries where we operate mm. to follow a just transition, moving fast enough so that we don't end up with, you know, materially problematic climate consequences, um, but not you know, but not too slow that 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 we can't address address those those issues. Yeah. So I think it is actually a massive opportunity to be at the forefront of financing an energy transition that is that is absolutely pivotal. And cyber risk that you alluded to is the is the final question um, that would keep 
anyone in your sector awake at night, surely? A absolutely. I mean, we do an extraordinary amount to protect our business and protect our, our clients and, and, and customers from, you know, let's say, say the bad guys. But, but the bad guys we know every single day are getting smarter and smarter. They, you know, they, in, in, in many cases, um, you know, almost state scale players, um, as we've seen in, in cyber sure. attacks around the world. Terrible. So mm. it's, it's an absolutely, you know, ongoing battle to ensure that we are cyber resilient. So we, we really want to make sure we don't get penetrated, but it's kind of inevitable that somewhere things are going to happen. And, and what you really need to do is to be able to react really, really quickly to that. Michael Brown, Chief Executive Officer of Nedbank. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and that's where we are going to leave it. I'm Jeremy Maggs. Thank you for watching.